let's go ahead and get started. Um, and panelists, you can go ahead and mute yourself until you're speaking. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to this round table to discuss One Vote One, which is a contemporary opera that tells the story of one woman's experience with voting. Welcome to our audience. We hope that you'll enjoy the time that we'll spend talking about this opera. I think you're going to find it as compelling as the opera and as interesting. Uh, and this is a great group of folks to have that discussion with. Before we get started, some introductions. Starting with John Holmes, who is the artistic director and CEO of Nashville Opera. And uh, going to Jennifer Whitcomb Oliva, who is a guest star with us today and sings the role of Frankie Pierce. Brooke Davis, who is another guest star vocalist with us today. She sings the role of Diane Nash. And Tamika Harris, guest star who sings the role of Gloria. Also with us, composer Dave Ragland and librettist for the opera, Mary McCollum and Nashville Opera staff member, Hannah Marco, who is education program coordinator. Welcome all panelists and welcome audience. Um, if you would mute yourself, um, we will leave some time for questions later. You may already be muted. And if you are, great. If you're not, go ahead and hit that little microphone at the bottom left of your screen and that will mute you. Um, and there is a chat feature if you're interested in uh, placing any questions in the chat. I think we're all pretty familiar with chat and familiar with Zoom at this point, but just going over that so that you can be assured that we'll be looking there and taking your questions and addressing them as best we can. So let's dive in and hear about this opera that was produced by the Nashville Opera Company, starting with a bit of background about how it came to be. And John, I'm going to ask you to give us some background um, in terms of the conceptualization and the commissioning for this opera. Sure, Th this piece began its life uh, as a part of a commemoration for women's suffrage in Tennessee. This year was the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And we, the Nashville Opera, were asked along with a lot of other arts groups to create um, a work or create, do to do something to celebrate that. And that's how this started. And so at first it was going to be some type of song cycle uh, in a partnership with the Tennessee State Museum. And then the COVID virus hit and we were looking at what to do. And I started researching women's suffrage uh, along with Carol Van West, who is a state historian. And uh, I, I stumbled on um, African-American women's suffrage, which I thought was a very interesting um, thing, which I knew very, very little about. I certainly didn't learn anything about it in school. And so I started researching it and found uh, some very interesting stories about some very courageous women. And, and then it started moving further into more courage and more courageous women and into the civil rights movement. And then today when we have voter disenfranchisement in so many places. And so, um, so we, we talked uh, to Dave Raglan, uh, who was just a terrific composer. And I wanted, we had lunch and I said, would you be interested in looking at this with me? And I said, here's an outline of an idea as far as a story. And would you work on this? And would you find a librettist that you think would, would work well with this idea? And so Dave brought in Mary McCallum and uh, they set work on creating this. And so what we ended up doing was creating a world premiere one act opera that we then uh, filmed, uh, not so much, not as a, as a stage piece that you video, but we reconceived the entire thing to be made as a movie. And so that's what we did. And, and that became the opera One Vote One. And so uh, you connected with Dave Raglan. And so Dave, I'm going to ask you about, you know, what, what inspired you in terms of, you've got this story outline from John 
and you have some idea of where the story should go, but how do you decide where the music should go? Well, with this, um, with this piece, I wanted to kind of show the perspective of each of the heroines, uh, pretty much from where they're coming from, both like literally and um, metaphorically. So we have influences coming from like modern, like modern music for you know Gloria, our protagonist, and also um, music that represents the times of um, both Frankie Pierce and Diane Nash. Mm -hmm. And what what inspires you generally to um, to to write music in a way that is authentic for you, but authentic also for the piece? Well, um, with I, I mean, I'm I'm influenced by like a, a bajillion sources. I'm a bit of a um, tragic musicologist uh, <laughs> in many sources. So with this piece, like I said, I really want to like pull from uh, just like a lot of sources. Um, like, well, I guess I should probably play something. Uh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> all right. Uh, so for example, like with Gloria, we first see her in the piece, right? And so with her, I wanted her music to be kind of current, um, but not too, too trendy. So um, I pulled from like, kind of like Robert Glasper, Layla Hathaway. So we kind of get what I call the Gloria theme, where it's that, um, So we hear that um, kind of, you know, throughout the piece and that serves as like her, her main theme and her first aria. And then with um, Frankie Pierce, we're introduced to her next. So she's coming from that post turn of the century uh, sound. And I wanted to pay homage to like a lot of the black composers and black songwriters um, of the time that we don't often hear about, um, like Eddie Green, uh, the Blakes, um, of course, you know, W.C. Handy. So we have like with her opening theme, this kind of uh, bluesy stride type. <laughs> Then she goes into her song about you know her parents and her upbringing and all of that, and so with the um, the last heroine Diane Nash, it could have been real easy for me to kind of go to like a pop type sound, you know, like a you know James Brown or you know Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bells type sound. But I was thinking, let me um let me kind of really pay homage to that time period, as I call it, the golden age of Fisk. Um, you know, with your um your Kennedys there, Matthew Kennedy and Anne Gamble Kennedy, and just all of the music that was just of that time. And so we have a lot of music inspired by like Julia Perry and um, Undine Smith Moore. And so with her music, uh, it has a lot of that inspiration, but also too, still um, a kind of a quotation or throwback to a lot of black songs. So I wanted to throw in because she talks about civil rights, I wanted to throw in, keep your eyes on the prize. Mm -hmm. So with one of her things, we have that, that aggressive thing when she talks about the, the sit-ins and then you throw in. You know, on top of it. And so, and then from there, the rest of the opera just takes off in a whole mm -hmm. other direction. <laughs> Indeed it does. And so for our audience, if you haven't uh, yet watched or heard the opera, um, you will have an opportunity to do that. We'll tell you how you can access it, but we won't give away any, any, any plot lines or, or a story that will, will be spoilers for you. But we do wanna hear from our librettist. And um, the, 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 the librettist is the person who writes the equivalent of the lyrics the text. And um, so Mary, tell us about um, how you take a story that you know, of course, is being set to music and uh, create a, the, the specificity. Uh, you've, you've been given the outline and some parameters just like Dave, right? But then it has to, it has to move and breathe and these characters have to be believable and real in some way. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read something from a book called Black Opera by Naomi Andre. 
And she says this, and I'd like you to respond to this quote. She said, I started going to the Metropolitan Opera in the 1980s while I was in college in New York. Opera audiences then were a bit different. Today, the realism on stage needs to be more closely aligned with what we experience in daily life. And so as you were writing, do you, in what ways do you think that there is that realism and these characters live and breathe and talk and sing the way that you believe is authentic for the opera? Well, I think that was definitely one of the things that worried me when I came on board, how was I gonna make this work? Um, you know, I was given our two historical characters, um, Frankie and Diane, and that we wanted a, a modern day character, but then to figure out, okay, how, how are they actually gonna interact? How would they actually meet? And so, you know, I, I definitely, you know, took some time to noodle on that, but excuse me. Um, basically how I approached it is really just trying to figure out how do I tell this story? How do I make it interesting? Especially when you're doing something that's, um, you're dealing with real people. I wanted it to be, you know, as factual as possible. Um, definitely something that would honor them. But at the same time, you want to make it interesting. It's you're not kind of like a dry, I'm just taking a history lesson here. So how do I make it interesting? How do I tell a story? So kind of once the framework came together, just really doing as much research as possible. Um, you know, trying to use as many of their own words if there were interviews and things that I could find to, to really make it come to life and just think about how would it be if you know, this character, Gloria, who is our central character, if she really was to meet these folks, you know, what would these conversations look like? And just trying to hear what it would sound like in my head. So that was pretty much my approach. So I definitely agree with that quote in terms of trying to make it as realistic and, and true to life, but at the same time, something that was interesting and hopefully would grab people's attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Gloria, uh, Gloria, Tamika, <laughs> Oh, Tamika, I think you're frozen. Um, so if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, your, your image is frozen, but I'm, oh, there you are, you're back. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so I, I really believe, and I hope that folks who uh, view the opera see the same thing as Mary intended that realism in Gloria, I definitely see her as real and as, as someone who uh, viewers can relate to. Uh, how, how do you channel or how did you prepare to become Gloria? Um, really, I just tried to tap into her, her character as being a college student um, and it helps a lot you know, teaching college students now and just observing how they think and how they approach life concerning different, you know, topics and things they're experiencing. And just young people in general, you know, I have a, a freshman in college and just, you know, thinking about his views in life towards political things and just life in general. And um, just trying to embrace all of that in, in this role. And then just studying the role and studying the words and, and what Gloria was experiencing um, throughout this opera and the things she was trying to overcome and understand as this character that's trying to understand these other ladies' points of view, um, you know, starting off not really wanting to understand, but then eventually opening up and trying to, to be more compassionate towards what they had experienced and what they were trying to get her to see. Well, one of the things I really like about uh, Gloria is that there, there's humor. Um, there are places where she is uh, really expressing herself in, in ways that are light. The, the, you know, it's light, it's lighthearted. It's, it, it, we understand where she's coming from. But, but we can laugh a little bit at, at some of these pieces. And was that Mary McCallum's uh, libretto um, or was that you personalizing the character a bit and bringing your own humor to it? Or both? I think it was a combination of both. I would say both. Um, I definitely tried to embrace all the different dynamics of emotions she was feeling. Um, John helped me a lot with that. Uh, just, he was great, just helping me be more comfortable, just 
you know, just embrace whatever's happening in that moment. You know, don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. Just, just be natural. How would you naturally be? Because as a, as a performer or actress or, you know, an artist, you want it to feel believable, you know, Mm -hmm. and not too over the top or not enough. So it's finding that balance of, you know, how would I just do in real life with this stuff? Because all of this stuff is real life. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, let me just, let me just be real for a minute. And when I was doing too much or not, you know, not in John would let me know like, Hey, let's, let's do this again and take a different approach to it. And he was just great at helping me with that. Like I just, he was great. (laughs) Thank you, John. (laughs) Well, well, let's, let's talk about John as a director a little bit. Brooke, uh, is your experience, what was your experience with John as a director? And in, in what ways you singing the character of Diane Nash, did he help you to bring out Diane Nash? Well, um, it's not my first time working with John. And I think he's come to just know how I work. And he knows he can just say, hey, do this. <laughs> and he he lets me run with it basically it's really a um a lot of fun to do uh, he'll give me guidelines when it, this is what i'm looking for this is what i want and then he'll just give it to me if he wants to see something else he'll say hey let's try it this way and we'll do that it's really a laid back process um very much like tamika said very comfortable um You don't always get that, so I'm very appreciative. (laughs) But (laughs) he's he's really a a lot for me, a lot of fun to work with. Well, let's let's hear your your perspectives on Diane Nash and portraying someone who's still alive, and thinking about um, still bringing a bit of yourself to the role. Uh, did you feel any any pressure in any way in that particular portrayal? Well, um, I did. It's if I'm if I think through it through my acting career as it as it were, I don't know that I've ever portrayed anyone who was who was still living. Um, and so there's always the thought of, what someone's thinking, are you preparing well? Can you really be authentic and bring yourself to someone else's personality that you really want people to see? Um, And so there was that pressure. But since the last time we spoke, I really had to think about some things. And I've, in thinking about this particular role and in hindsight, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I managed to come across roles where I find a a piece of my heart already lives there. And with the dynamic that's happening in the world around us, I was feeling a sense of what can I do? What am I supposed to do in this particular time? What is my role? What is my part? And in the section where Diane talks about stepping forward into this movement to desegregate these lunch counters, I found myself really living into that, what is my role at this time? What am I supposed to do? And I think more than anything, that's what comes out. And that's how I attach myself to the role. And that's what I'm hoping uh, people will get from maybe what Diane was thinking at the time. What is my role? What is my part? Am I supposed to do this? Am I really supposed to do this? Because this is crazy. Uh, (laughs) But um, it became easier um, through the process, just sort of living into that feeling and allowing my, my heart more or less to take over and just run. So Jennifer, singing the role yeah. of, of Frankie Pierce. Um, Frankie, from the moment that she appears on screen for me has uh, presence. And 
I, I, I would love for you to talk about, you know, just thinking about what Dave said about the music that inspired him in, in shaping Frankie musically. Uh, can you talk a bit about that presence and the role of the music in inspiring you in the way that it inspired Dave? Did he get it right? Did he get it right, Jennifer? You know what? <laughs> I, I do believe he did. I, I do believe Dave got it, it, it right. Um, I think for Frankie, um, from what we know of Frankie Pierce, since she is the actual uh, ghost in this piece, uh, no longer living, uh, from the time period in which she lived, the way we know, um, the way uh, women's roles were in society, um, uh, the music that was happening, I, I feel that that was easy. Uh, it was almost kind of set out. It was set out on a little silver platter and it, it, that was easy to get into. Um, so I think the music, the musicality of it with it being so bold, uh, there's something that's very playful, that jazz, that swing. Um, and as a black woman, uh, you know, she means business. So I feel that um, that presence, the way that she holds herself, the way that she uh, even approaches these musical lines, um, I feel that, that there is a, a certain uh, strength to her. There's something that's very strong. There's something that's very bold. Um, and she is a uh, matter of fact. I think that there is something very matter of fact about this woman, um, or at least that's what I was going for. So um, yeah, the music, I think it is right. It feels right, um, especially when you do get to see the piece and you see the um, uh, on-site location shots. Uh, it just feels so appropriate to hear that music and to see her walking past the Hermitage Hotel and walking up the steps and, and really um, being there in the moment. Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's right. <laughs> so Dave, the, you got the thumbs up, all right, from, from a, the singer, so good job. Um, well, it's a wonderful job, really. Uh, so th this is an opera question. All right, I'm going to go there in terms of the, an opera question. Uh, first, I'm going to come back to, to you, Jennifer, in terms of ghosts in opera. Let you chew on that for a minute and, and then come back. Uh, but so Dave, you know, opera, maybe our viewers are seasoned opera goers. Maybe they're, maybe they're not. Um, what would you say to, to listen for from the perspective of the composer for this opera? What would you, what do you want people to hear? Well, I would say for people to be able to come to it, um, honestly relaxed um, and with an open mind, um, they don't have to come think they're gonna see powdered wigs and a foreign language they never heard of. And, you know, just a lot of, you know, stuff. Um, it's very accessible, you know, going in from the jump, you know, when I spoke with, with Mary and also with John and the Nashville Opera, it's like, okay, this, you know, let's, it's accessible, you know, opera is for everyone. It's, I think it's the model. So it's literally something for everybody. So um, going into it really just kind of with open ears and um, yeah, open ears and feel free to watch it once, twice, as many times as you like kind of catch some things that didn't catch at the beginning. I've seen it a bajillion times and I always see something new. So yeah. <laughs> indeed, uh, indeed. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it twice and um, pretty sure that I will see it yet again soon. And uh, the first time I watched it there, there I had an emotional reaction, a strong emotional reaction. Uh, I had that same reaction, not identically, but but also a very strong reaction the next time I watched it, but for a different reason. But I'm gonna ask my ghost question first, and then and then we'll get back to that. So uh, hang on, Jennifer. So first, John, ghosts and opera. Um, I mean, I don't want I don't want to give anything away, but we already know that there is one, mm. and. 
and we know it's Jennifer. Okay. So uh, <laughs> there, I, I like ghosts and opera and we're on the eve of Halloween. And so what, what would you say about this ghost and some traditional ghosts and maybe this opera and traditional operas? Well, I think that it's interesting. Ghosts play an important part of many operas that have supernatural, but often the ghosts come to uh, maybe not so much in a way of horror, but as a sign or as a way to come and teach us a little something that we should know. And I think that's the way Dave and Mary have used this, is I think Jennifer in this, as Ray Frankie Pierce, is, is she becomes more of a spirit of what can happen and 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 her, I really admire the way they've written her, as, and the way Jennifer plays her as a very strong character, and Diane Nash as well. Uh, I will say that a friend of mine who is a pretty hardcore opera person, um, I didn't know what he would think about this because if it gets away from like maybe Traviata, he's kind of concerned sometimes. He's a very tr traditionalist, you know, and uh, and so he he told me he was going to watch it, and so it, the the piece premiered on a Friday and around 9.30 in the morning, I got a text from him and he said, I just watched the show. Do you have a minute to talk? And of course, as usual, I'm in a Zoom meeting. And so I text back and say, you know, I'd love to talk. Um, uh, I'm in a meeting right now. Can I call you when this is done? And he texted back and said, that would be terrific. I'll open another box of Kleenex. <laughs> uh, and that was a good sign. And so I called him later and he was so touched by the piece, musically and dramatically and the acting. And he too mentioned that the acting was terrific in a very naturalistic way that's, that often you don't find, especially in recorded opera. It's sometimes too big or it's, it, it goes too far. Um, but I think I'm very proud of everyone here because I think we reached a good balance with this, that it stays natural. And so it feels real, uh, even when they're ghosts, mm -hmm. even when, even when, you know, the people aren't really there. It's, there's still a realism to it about them. There's a realism there. Uh, so Jennifer, what, what, What's your response to, to John's assessment of this ghost? I agree with everything that you said. Um, and as, as the performer, as the actor singer, um, my goal, it was important for me to really play this character uh, in knowing that she was a real person. I, I did not want her to come off as just this, you know, specter that's like, go, go, you know, like I want, you know, I, I wanted her to be the real Frankie Pierce, somebody that, that you would go have lunch with somebody. I wanted it to feel as if at any point Frankie could have just reached out and grabbed Gloria and shook her, you know, or just, 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 you know, it, it real, as real as possible, because I, I don't think that the message would have came all the way through if it was played as though she was, you know, just the house on Haunted Hill, you know, just creating a ruckus somewhere. Um, I, I don't think it would have gone in the same direction. Um, and I think that the way that it was written really is what makes it what it is um because it's it's so confrontational um that i think that it is uh it's more poignant that way i think um and that's so nice to hear john that your friend was so moved by it and i hope that that others are moved by it but definitely as a ghost i uh, i definitely didn't feel that way i did not feel that it was presented that way and 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 I'm glad I'm glad to hear that because that's definitely what I was going for for a real person to just show up and have something very important to say um 
And I think that if she was still with us, that's, I think it's pretty close to, if she was going to sing a song, <laughs> I think that's what Frankie probably would have had to say to a young, a young Black voter. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so Tamika, uh, I, I talked a moment ago about my own emotional reaction to, to the opera. John talked about his friend's emotional reaction to the opera. Um, one was an emotional reaction I had because I, I love opera and I, I want to be caught up in the moment. And, uh, but another one I have is because it's, it's all black women singing a story that feels really relevant. And uh, your portrayal of Gloria as a central character, the central character uh, is an important part of the conveyance of those feelings that you know, evokes that emotion. In, when people watch. So can you, can you talk about um, your own emotional reaction to playing, playing this role? Uh, you've watched it too. You now had a chance to step back and see it. And what's your reaction now as someone stepping back as a central character and as opposed to singing it in the moment and trying to portray and say what Gloria has to say? Um, I think the difference with watching it, um, I guess just my reaction and my approach to life period with this storyline and just the way I want to convey this feeling of compassion. I believe I've said this before, the compassion and the unconditional love that's super big for me in life, be it playing a role or in, in, in real life with other beings, um, just trying to convey that message. Because I, I think for me, that's the underlying tone that needs to be present in all things um, concerning all topics, all subjects, all matters. Because without that, we have division. We have nothing. We have nothing to, to give us foundation to stand on to bring unity to, to one another. And so playing that, that role, um, I wanted to make sure I embrace that part of me as Tamika and as Gloria and trying to understand these two women and what they were trying to tell me. And, you know, I got all the attitude and, and all the sass and stuff, but just knowing that that's just, that's just that shell. That's that, that's that cover up that, people tend to hide behind, be it, you know, whatever they're, uh, I guess whatever you may be dealing with in life. I think we've lost you, Tamika. Hopefully we didn't lose you because we really want to hear the rest of that. But um, yep, you're frozen and we can't hear you at the moment. Okay, now you're coming back. Oh. Uh oh, you're back. Yeah. Back. Okay, sorry, but I was saying, um, as Gloria goes through this opera and just opens up um, to these ideas that the women are trying to give to her and and trying to get her to understand, and just embracing that compassion and embracing that that love to to understand another human being what they've experienced, and that was the thing with the history and the things that she learned. And, and understanding, okay, they really do have a message. You know, let me let me step outside of myself and this ego and try to listen. And a lot of times we don't do that as people to truly listen to a person and not just, you know, just hear what they're saying and just, it means nothing, but to truly listen and understand where a person's coming from, regardless of what their views are. We have to try to learn to listen to each other and show that compassion instead of judging and, and doing all the stuff that keeps us divided. And that, that makes a lot of sense, that, that, sense. that compassion that. that was so central to informing what you brought to this role would translate and 
create this emotional response. Uh, I think maybe that's a, a big part of what created that emotional response for me and, and others perhaps who, who have watched it. Um, so we, we're, we're just outside of the presidential debate hosted here on Belmont's campus last week, Belmont Plug. And um, we're so proud of that as a university. And let's talk a little bit about voting and this opera as a, as a vehicle to, to talk about voting. Mary, how is this opera a vehicle about voting? Is it? It's supposed to be? <laughs> So I think so. I think it's that's part of it for sure. I think that's a big, big message of it. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that, you know, underlie that to get to the heart of it. But at the end, you know, the message is go vote. Your voice needs to be heard. Your um, your voice is important and that we all have to join together. My vote plus your vote and all these other votes. That's how we make change, at least part of how we make change. So definitely. So I think it took um, you know, there's a lot of things in the story that under that underlie it and get us to that message in terms of, you know, the heart of what Gloria is really going through. That's really what I tried to find, not just the surface of why somebody wouldn't want to go vote, but really kind of dig deeper. There's a lot of emotions out there right now. So, um, but yes, I would say definitely voting is definitely a, a really important message of this piece. And, you know, we definitely want people to go out there and vote and make their voice heard. Do you have a, a favorite line that you wrote that you feel em embodies that message? Put you on the spot, Mary. <laughs> you on the spot. So I don't know if I'll remember the line exactly, but I think um, one of the things, and I think it's, um, well, Diane talks about how she was, um, she was pregnant and they were threatening to put her in jail. Um, and she was willing to go to jail if it meant that, um, you know, her child would have, you know, better, um, a better life and other people's children. And that if she was willing to do that, I think Frankie asked if, if she was willing to do that, if she's willing to go to jail six months pregnant, you can't even go out there and vote. What is that? So I, to me, I, that, that's really strong. To me, that's important because if, you know, a lot of people, me, me included, I would be questioning going to jail, period, let's <laughs> all going to jail six months pregnant, but that she was willing to do that, that she was willing to put herself out there like that, because this is so important. I think that's just one of the things that people who came before us did. And so we can't, we can't throw away their sacrifice and sit at home and not vote. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooke? Do you want to comment on that since she's just mentioned Diane and that sacrifice? Um, this piece, I think it, it struck right at the right time. And I hope many people get a chance to sit with it, watch it one or two times and let what's being said resonate with them. Um, when you ask Mary about her favorite line, I, I keep coming back to the section where Diane asks the mayor if he believes segregation was wrong and in this voting climate for people to vote, vote their heart, vote their conscience, vote what they believe because these people that are making decisions <laughs> for us, um, that, that's a really important thing. And I would encourage people to look at the fact that we had protesters downtown who had um, been threatened with felonies for protesting and with a felony conviction, you, you can't vote. Um, and to think that you can be arrested and charged with a felony offense and then lose your right to vote because you are speaking your mind. And unless I'm incorrect, we all have a right to speak our minds. 
and those people they weren't being destructive they were they were peaceful protests and so i think it's important that um we we all step out there and yes i'd like to say it matter it it does matter who you vote for in my opinion but i'm not here to tell anybody how they should vote um just the fact that you have to too many people have fought for it too many people have died for it too many people out here don't care about it um so those of us that do we have to leave me alone jennifer <laughs> we we have to we we have to go ahead on and vote. And that's just where I am with that today. <laughs> well, that's why we're here, listening to your insights. So, you know, we appreciate that, that kind of candor. Um, so I want to give our audience an opportunity to ask questions of these panelists. You've heard them talk about this opera and, and uh, hopefully it's inspired you to, to see it. If you haven't seen it, and if you have seen it, ask us a question if you, if you have one. You can put it in the chat and uh, we'll be glad to take a look at it and, and respond. So while, while we're waiting for the audience to, to think about their questions, and provide them to us. Uh, I'm going to go to to Jennifer, and so Jennifer, you have said that that this is a this is a black opera, and we do know we have our uh, wonderful, spectacular vocalists who are African American, and our wonderful, spectacular composer who is African-American and our wonderful, spectacular librettist who is African-American and the folks that you can't see and that are not on this panel today are the musicians who we hear in the opera who are also African-American. And so you have said that it's a black opera. Uh, and, and do you say that because of the who or is there uh, another reason why you, you feel that. I just, I personally think that it is black. It is all encompassing black. It is, uh, uh, it, it's just what you said. I mean, it is uh, the librettist, the, the composer, the, the um, artists. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I mean, if you wanted to break it down, uh, the way that this is written and what's being said, this story is not for anyone else to sing, if that makes any sense. I feel that, you know, if they had cast a, 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 a Caucasian woman to play Frankie Pierce, that would be a bit strange. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, it is so exciting. I, I mean, I just think it's so exciting to have this brand new contemporary black piece. Um, and I hope that it is inspiring for uh, so many people, uh, for, for other black artists and black companies uh, for sure. But I hope that uh, in the opera world that this is inspiring for people that they can see that this can be done that we can sing these things, we can carry these roles, we can write these roles, we can compose this music. Uh, and I, I hope that in the future, we are given uh, more opportunities to do so. Uh, so yes, this is a, this is a black opera um, and it is a beautiful black opera. I'm very excited about it. John, as the artistic director and CEO of Nashville Opera. You have uh, produced it and identified everybody who is here today. And uh, it, it's always a risk to commission a brand new piece that's never been seen or done or written before. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose to, to take this risk? Uh, you know, we're, we're in a world that's turned a little upside down right now. And I think it's the time to take a risk. 
but uh, but I knew Dave's work. You know, I knew Dave. I did not know Mary. Uh, but you're right. Uh, commissioning a piece, and one reason a lot of companies, especially smaller companies, don't do it, is um, you 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 don't know what you're going to get. You aren't sure. Um, but but I felt really good about this from the start. I felt it was an important story that needed to be told. Uh, and when I first saw Mary's libretto, I think I called Dave and said, I think this is just what we're looking for because it really did hit all the points and the moments that, that I was hoping it would. And, and there is one moment in it um, that I, I, it's just a little tiny, tiny moment, but I think, it's, I think it's my favorite moment of the piece. And that happens near the end, again, no spoilers, but at one point, all three women are, are singing around the same time. And, um, and they're singing about how it's, it's uh, that one vote can make a change and, and change can start with me. And two of the women echo with you, uh, with you and, and you and you. And, and it's Jennifer who, who has this one, it's only two words. And all she says is, and you. And I remember when we filmed it because we did it a certain way. It's the only time any character breaks the fourth wall and speaks to the audience or to the camera. And, um, and I remember we're doing this at one time and Jennifer, we did, we went through it, we did it. And Jennifer said, we're not supposed to do that, right? And I said, no, I think it's okay, let's try it. And we did a few different takes of it. But that's the one that really stuck. And that one time where a character talks to me and it gets me every single time. And a lot of it's the way Jennifer plays it. It's almost like she notices I'm there and then turns out and speaks. And my response, Jennifer, is always, yes, ma'am, because it's so, it's Frankie Pierce authoritative, you know? And it's not in a bad way. It's just, this is your responsibility. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the outcome, Cheryl. But at the start, nobody knows. But sometimes we all need to take risks. And I, I think more opera companies should take that type of risk on different shows like this. Well, we have a question from our audience. It's for Dave. And Dave, the question is, what was your process like for composing this score? Did you have any struggles while composing? I would say probably, well, it was, it was pretty quick. Um, let me just say the whole turnaround for this was, was pretty amazing. You guys say so, I said, it's not. Uh, <laughs> but me and Mary, and Eric, well, I'll just pat ourselves on the back. But, um, but uh, as far as struggles with composing, I would say um, just with the libretto was so detailed. And one thing, one of the reasons why I love Mary McCallum's writing is that she's a great historian and historical writer. So I was like, yes, Mary, give me every word, every detail, every fact, yes. And so I wanted to, you know, kind of wait, find a way to really implement all of that in while having a very beautiful lyrical piece. So it was a bit of a juggling act. Um, just to kind of, you know, get all of it in. Because I mean, there's some composers who just write a whole opera on like 10 words. You know, we're talking about 20th century, 21st century. But it's like, with this, I knew it was such a great um, libretto and script. It's like, how do we get this drama? And how do I, how do I kind of you know, honor it musically? And also um, give these wonderful singing actresses uh, some, some really great music and really give the directors uh, something, you know, really, you know, something meaty to work with. So that for me was probably the biggest, um, I guess you'd say struggle or, you know, biggest challenge. And then the other one, just the time frame, but that was kind of easy for me because I tend to write fast. Um, I feel like I'm Tyler Perry sometimes, just writing out a show in two days. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to but, um, but yeah, but other than that, it was, a, honestly, it was, a challenge it was a blast. It was a blast to create this opera and I cannot wait uh, to, to write more opera. So uh, is there a, a thought that any of you would like to leave with our audience? What would you say is there a line that you would like to sing, Tamika, Brooke, Jennifer? <laughs> you 
Well, I would like to say that uh, I know uh, as you guys were talking about voting and how it's important um, and uh, Frankie Pierce and the things that I have learned, I, I think that it is so important that we find our courage. We find our courage and we find our voice and we use it. Um, I know I've said before and I truly, I truly believe that the, these women um, in this movement, these, these women and these black women have paved a path for us. It, they have paved this way for us and spent all this time to get us where we are now. And all we have to do is find our courage, put one foot in front of the other and walk it. Walk that path. And I, I believe that we will be able to get to that, that oasis, that place. I, and I don't know what that is, but I know it's there somewhere and we can reach it and we can get there, but we, we have to be the ones to, to, to continue the work. Uh, the work is not finished. It is not done. We must continue. So I, I would love for everyone out there to find your courage and trust yourselves and to continue to walk this path. Find your courage, trust yourself. Yeah, it's definitely an opera that uh, spotlights focuses on intersectionality, the intersection of being female and being black, which there, there, there should be an opera about that. <laughs> and this opera highlights that, that intersectionality. It's something to watch for. It's something I would say if you're watching as an audience member, that's something to watch for. Where, where do we see those intersections? Uh, Tamika. What would you say would be your parting words? My parting words, I'm gonna piggyback off of Jennifer a little bit. Um, find your courage to love yourself and find your courage to stop judging yourself because until you do that for yourself, you can't do it for others. So we've gotta to learn to love ourselves and really understand what that means um yeah because that's the only way we can reflect it back to someone else that compassion that you were talking about earlier and and turning that compassion inward and not just outward yeah. um but that it has an outward impact which um is important especially as we go to the polls next week uh, don't don't miss this opera. It's in my in my view, it's historic. It's historic for Nashville. It's historic for uh, the story, a story of Black women's suffrage, and it's uh, it's historic. I think for Nashville Opera as an opera company as as well. So uh, congratulations to Nashville Opera. We thank you, John, uh, for bringing this opera to Nashville. And, and we thank you, uh, Dave and Mary, for breathing life into it uh, that we want to, to hear and listen to what it has to say. It meets our ears in ways that I, I certainly have enjoyed. And thank you, singers, for acting these roles in ways that have compelled tears in my experience and in John's friends. And um, you'll have to watch it for yourself audience to, to have that experience. But I, I certainly wanna thank all our panelists for the contribution that you've made to the arts world that has this social impact and import. And thank you for taking time out this afternoon to talk about it so that we can enjoy it that much more. That concludes this roundtable discussion. We thank you all for joining us and uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>